Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie Lilly, O'Star, uh, Chloe and Bella. And as always, I want to remind you, please stay safe, healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and notification bell. And I know it's been a while since I've uh, done any videos. I'm sorry about that. Today we're going to get back into Homer and summarize, summary and analysis of Book 10 and 11. And let's get there. The analysis, summary analysis, the books 10 and 11 of Homer, and then we're going to get back into book 12. The Achaeans sail from the land of the Cyclops to the home of Aeolus, ruler of the wet winds. Aeolus presents Odysseus with a bag containing all the winds, and he stirs up a westerly wind to guide Odysseus and his crew home. Within 10 days, they're in sight of Ithaca, but Odysseus' shipmates, who think that Aeolus has secretly given Odysseus given Odysseus a fortune in gold and silver, tear the bag open. The winds accept and stir, excuse me, the wind escape and stir up a storm that brings Odysseus and his men back to Aeola. This time, however, Aeolus refers, refuses to help them, certain that the gods hate Odysseus and wish to do him harm. Lacking wind, the Achaeans row to the land of the Laos, Laestrogonians, a race of powerful giants whose king Antiphades and, and unnamed queen turn Odysseus' scouts into dinner. Odysseus and his remaining men flee f forward to their ships, but the Laostrian, the Laostrogonians, these big, these names, Greek names, pelt the ships with boulders and sink them as they sit in the harbor. Only Odysseus' ship escapes. From there, Odysseus and his men travel to Aea. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> Home of the beautiful witch goddess Circe. Circe. Circe drugs a band of Odysseus' men and turns them into pigs. When Odysseus goes to rescue them, Hermes approaches him in the form of a young man. He tells Odysseus to eat an, eat an herb called moly to protect himself from Circe's drug and then lunge at her when she tries to strike him with her sword. Odysseus follows Hermes' instructions, overpowering Cer Circe and forcing her to change his men back to their human forms. Odysseus soon becomes Circe's lover, and he and his men live with her in luxury for a year. When his men finally persuade him to continue the voyage homeward, Odysseus asks Circe for the way back to Ithaca. She replies he must sail to Hades, the realm of the dead, to speak with the spirit of Tiresias, a blind prophet who will tell him how to get home. A lot of people uh, mistake Hades and hell for the same thing I myself used to, but not exactly. It's the realm of the dead. The next morning, Odysseus rouses his men for the imminent departure. His dis he discovers, however, that the youngest man in his crew, Elpinor, had gotten drunk the previous night, slept on the roof, and when he heard the men shouting and marching in the morning, fell from the roof and broke his neck. Odysseus explains to his men the course that they must make, they, that they must take, which they are displeased to learn is rather meandering. Odysseus travels to the river of Ocean in the land of the Sumerians. There he pours libations and performs sacrifices as Circe and earlier instructs him to do to attract the souls of the dead. The first to appear is that of Alpador, the crewman who broke his neck, falling from Circe's roof. He begs Odysseus to return to me to Circe's island and give his body a proper burial. Odysseus then speaks with the Th Theban prophet Tiresias, who reveals that Poseidon is punishing the Achaeans for blinding his son Polyphemus. He foretells Odysseus' fate, that he will return home, reclaim his wife and palace from the wretched suitors, and then make another trip to a distant land to appease Poseidon. He warns Odysseus not to touch the flocks of the sun, when he reaches the land of Thrinacia, otherwise he won't return home without suffering much more hardship and losing all his crew. When Tiresias departs, Odysseus calls other spirits toward him. He speaks with his mother, Anticlea, who updates him on the affairs of Ithaca and relates how 
She died of grief, waiting for his return. He then meets the spirits of various famous men, heroes, and hears the stories of their lives and deaths. I drink here. Odysseus so. now cuts short the tale and asks his Phoenician hosts to allow him to sleep, but the king and queen urge him to continue, asking if he met any of the Greeks who fell at Troy in Hades. He relates his encounters there. He meets Agamemnon, who tells him of his murder at the hands of his wife, Clytemnestra. Next, he meets Achilles, who asks about his son, Neoptolemus. Odysseus then tries to speak with Ajax, an Achillean, and excuse me, an Achaean, who killed himself after he lost a contest with Odysseus over the arms of Achilles. But Ajax refuses to speak and slips away. He sees Heracles, King Minos, the hunter Orion, and others. He witnesses the punishment of Sisyphus struggling eternally to push a boulder over a hill only to have it roll back down where, whenever it reaches the top. He then sees Tantalus uh, agonized by hunger and thirst. Tantalus sits in a pool of water overhung by bunches of grapes, but whenever he reaches for the grapes, they rise out of grasp. And whenever he bends down to drink, the water sit, sinks out of reach. Odysseus soon finds himself mobbed by his souls, wishing to ask about their relatives in the world above. He becomes frightened, runs back to his ship, and immediately sails away. The analysis of books 10 and 11. Fix this a little bit. The mortal tendency to succumb to temptation manifests itself through book through, uh, excuse me, tendency to sub manifest itself through, throughout Book 10. Okay. Just as Odysseus taunts the blinded Polyphemus in Book G by boasting about his defeat of the Cyclops, the members of his crew prove unable to resist looking into Aeolus his bag, and their greed ends up complicating their nostrils. A homeward voyage, as important and illustrative of weak-mindedness, however, is that Odysseus, let's say, a year waste away in the arms of the goddess Circe. While his crew certainly seems not to mind the at respite, Odysseus particularly enjoys it, even though his wife is waiting for him. The drunk Elpinor's death, as the men are about to depart from home, constitutes another instance of overindulgence in personal appetite. Only when his crew prods him and causes delays madness is Odysseus persuaded to leave Circe's realm. The crew members' lukewarm feelings for the place are understandable. After all, they have to suffer the humiliation of being transformed initially to pigs and receive no recompense comparable to the love of a goddess. Indeed, in Book 10, for the first time, we hear the crew criticize its leader, refusing repeatedly to return to Circe's halls after the other skulls are transformed into pigs. The crew member, your locus, issues an especially stinging reproach of Odysseus for foolishly leading his crew to its destruction. He presents the death of their comrades at the hands of Polyphemus as evidence of Odysseus' imprudence. Thanks to Odysseus' rashness, they died, to, they died too. Though Odysseus checks his anger and restores calm, the unrest illustrates the holes in his authority. With the appearance of the various heroes and lesser divinities, Book 11 gives the modern reader an extraordinary anthology of mythological lives. Homer's audience would already have been familiar with the stories of such figures as Heracles, Minos, Achilles, Agamemnon, Sisyphus, and... Tantalus, and people turned to them for an authoritative versions of the Greek myths, even in the later ancient period. For the modern reader, they provide invaluable insight to early Greek mythology, again by juxta juxtaposing excuse me, I said that wrong, Odysseus' wanderings to the woes of these legendary figures. Homer both broadens the scope of his poem and further entrenches his hero in his culture's mythology, and even being allowed enter Hades, Odysseus attains a privileged transcendent status. Odysseus' conversation with Achilles reveals a nuanced view of warfare and, and Cleos that's what it says, or glory, which is harder to find in the Iliad. Achilles' declaration, I'd rather slave on earth for another man than rule down here over all the breathless dead. Interesting. 
alludes to his dilemma, depicted in the Iliad of choosing between earning glory on the battlefield but dying young and living a long, uneventful life. The Iliad, which celebrates the glory of warfare wholeheartedly, endorses Achilles' choice of glory over long life. Achilles' lament in Book 11 of the Odyssey issued is a strong caveat to this ethic of Cleo's. This change in Achilles' sentiment from one moment from one poem to the ne next is understandable, given that, as we have seen with Odysseus, the Odyssey tends to focus on characters' inner lives. Yet Achilles doesn't wholly shun on the idea of Cleo's, though he turns away somewhat from his warrior ethos. He still rejects. He still rejoices to hear that his son has become a great warrior. Cleos is thus evolved from an accepted cultural value into a more complex and somewhat problematic pr principle. Positioned near the very heart of this epic, of the epic, the underworld segment ties together the poem's various settings. Anticlea recalls these those pining way for Odysseus in Ithaca. Agamemnon and Achilles shift our thoughts back to Troy. Albino ties in the past, near past on Circe's island and the present responsibilities that Odysseus has to his crew. Finally, the interruption in Odysseus' account reminds us of where he is now, in the palace of the Phaeacians. The interruption seems to have no other function, and it doesn't make much <coughs> sense within the context of the plot. It is hard to believe, for instance, that Odysseus would want to go to sleep before describing the most important conversations he had in Hades, and in fact, he doesn't go to sleep. Histories of his wanderings go on for another book and a half. The interruption is transparently used to break the long first-person narrative into similar, more manageable chunks. It's the end of the um, summary and analysis of 10 and 11, and we will get into book 11, I mean back to book 12 that is, <coughs> It's a fairly short book. I'd like to get through this book for you, so you, I'm not enjoying it, but I, so we can get, because we're going to get into other, well, I'll get you that in the end. Book 12, Sea Perils and Defeat. The ship sailed on out of the ocean stream, riding a long swell on the open sea. For the island of Aea, summer, summering dawn has danced, dancing grounds there, and the sun is rising. His... The sun his rising, but still by night was beached on a sand shelf and waited in beyond the line of breakers to fall asleep awaiting the day star. When the dawn, young dawn with a fingertip of ro with fingertips of rose made heaven bright, I sent shipmates to bring Elpinor's body from the house of Kirky. We others cut down timber on the foreland on a high point and built his pyre of logs. Then stood by weeping while the flame burnt through coarse and equipment. Then we heaped his barrow, lifting a gravestone on the mound and fixed his light, but unwarped our, our or against the sky. These were our rites in memory of him. Soon then, knowing us back from the dark land, Kirky came, freshly adorned for us, with handmade bearing loaves, roast meats, and rust ruby-colored wine. Fix that a little bit there for you. She stood among us in immortal beauty, jesting. Hearts of oak, did you go down? Alive into the home of, homes of death, one visit finishes all men, but yourselves twice mortal. Come here as meat and wine. Enjoy your feasting for one whole day, and in the dawn tomorrow you shall put out to sea. Sailing directions, landmarks, perils I shall sketch for you, you know, to keep you from being caught by land or water in some black sack of trouble, in high humor and ready for carousel. We agreed. So all that day until the sun went down, we feasted on roast meat and good red wine, till after sunset at the fall of night. The men... I turned that on. That's weird. Sorry. The men dropped off to sleep by the stern housers. She took my hand then, silent in the hush, drew me apart, made me sit down and lay beside me softly, questioning as I told all I had seen from first to last. Then said the lady, Kirky... So all those trials are over. Listen with care. To this now, and a god will arm your mind. Square in your ships, paths are serenies crying, Beauty to which men coasting by. Woe to the innocent who hears that sound. He will not see his lady nor his children. Enjoy crowding about him. Home from sea, the serenies will sing his mind away. 
On their sweet meadow lolling, there are bones of dead men rotting in a pile beside them, and flayed skin shrivel round the spot. Steer wide. Keep well to see where it plug your oarsman's ears. With beeswax needed and sobbed, none of the rest should hear that song. But if you wish to listen, let the men tie you in the lugger hand and foot back to the mast, lashed to the mast. So you may hear those harpies' thrilling voices. Shout as you will, begging to be untied. Your crew must only twist more line around you and keep their stroke up till the singers fade. What then? One or two courses you may take. And you yourself must weigh them. I shall not plan the whole action for you now, but only will you of both tell you, excuse me, but only tell you of both. Head are beetling rocks, and dark blue glancing infiltry surging roars around them. Prowling rocks are drifters. The gods in bliss have named them. Name them well. Not even birds can pass them by. Not even the timorous doves that bear ambrosia, but to Father Zeus. Caught by downdrafts, they die. On Rockwell smooth as ice, each time the father wafts a new courier to make up his crew. Siluscan ships get sea room of these drifters, whose boiling surf under high, fiery winds carries tossing wreckage of ships and men, only one ocean-going craft. The far-famed Argo made it sailing from Atia. But she, too, would have crashed on the big rocks if Hera had not pulled her through her love of Aeson, her captain. A second course lies between headlands. One is a sharp mound piercing the sky with storm cloud round the peak, dissolving never none the brightest summer. To show heavens deserved there, nor in the fall, no mortal man could scale it, nor so much as land there, not with twenty hands and feet, no, so shift, so sheer the cliffs are, as of polished stone midway that height, a cavern full of mist, opens towards Erebos an evening skirting. This in the lugger, great Odysseus, your master bowman, shooting from the deck, would come. Did I go out? Yeah, I back there. Yeah. And this in the lugger, great Odysseus, your master bowman, shooting from the deck, would come short of the cave mouth with his shaft. But that is the den of Skyla, where she yaps abominably, and newborn's whelps cry, though she is huge and monstrous, god or man, no one could look her and look on her and enjoy her legs, and there are twelve, or like great tentacles, unjointed, and upon her serpent necks are born six heads like nightmares of ferocity, of ferocity, with triple serried rows of fangs and deep gullets of black death, half her length she sways her head in air, outside her horrid cleft, hunting the sea around that promontory, for dolphins, dogfish, or what bigger game, thundering, amphiteries, feeds in thousands, and no ship's company can claim to have passed her without Lost in grief, she takes <coughs> from every ship one man for every gullet. The opposite point seems more a tongue of land. You touch with a good bow shot at the narrows. A great wild fig, a shaggy mass of leaves, grows on it. And Carabidus lurks below to swallow down the dark sea tide. Three times from, down to, from dawn to dusk, she spews it up and sucks it down against three times a whirling maelstrom if you come upon her, then the god who makes her tremble could not save you. No hug. The cliff of Skyla, take your ship, through on a racing stroke, better to mourn six men than lose them all, and the ship too. So her advice ran, but I faced her saying, only instruct me, goddess, if you will, how, if possible, can I pass Caribidus, or fight off, Skyla, when she raids my crew, swiftly that loveliest goddess tw answered me, must you have battle in your heart forever? The bloody toil of combat, old contender, will you not yield to the immortal gods? That nightmare cannot die, being eternal evil itself, horror and pain and chaos. There's no fighting her. No power can fight her. All that avails is flight. Lose headway there. Along that net rock face, while you break out arms, and she'll swoop over you, I fear, once more, taking one man again for every gullet. No, no, put all your backs into it. Row on. 
Invoke blind force that bore the scourge of men. To keep her from a second strike against you. Then you will coast Thranachia, the island where Helios cattle graze. Fine herds and flocks of, godly, of goodly sheep. The herds and flocks are seven, with fifty beasts in each. No lambs are dropped. Well, calves in these fat cattle never die. Immortal, too. They're... Cowherds are their shepherds, Phaethusa and Lampetia, sweetly braided nymphs that divine the area bore to the overlord of a high noon. Helios, these nymphs, their gentle mother bred and place upon Thrinachia, the distant land, and care of flocks and cattle for their father. Now give those kind a wide berth, keep your thoughts intent upon your course for home, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Rough years then lie between you and your homecoming alone and old, the one survival all companions lost. As Kirky spoke, Dawn mounted her golden throne, and on the first raise, Kirky left me, taking her ways like a great goddess up the island. I made straight for the ship, roused up the men to get bo aboard, and cast off at the stern, they scrambled to their places by the rowlocks, and all in line dipped oars in the great sea. But soon an offshore breeze blew to our liking, a canvas-bellying breeze, a lusty shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sun-bright hair. So we made fast the braces, and we rested, letting the winds and steersmen work the ship. The crew being now silent before me, I addressed them sore at heart. Dear friends, more than one man or two should... Know these things, those things, Kirky foresaw for us and shared with me. So let me tell her forecast that we die with our eyes open. If we are going to die or know that what death we baffle, if we can, Sir Serenies weaving a haunting song over the sea. We are to shun, she said, and their green shore all sweet with clover. Yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore, you are about to tie me up. You are to tie me up. Tied as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast, and if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muffle me. I rather dwelt on this part of the forecast while our good ship made time. Bound outwards down the wind for the strange island of Serenies, and all at once the wind fell in a calm, came over all the sea as though some power lulled lull the swell. The crew were on their feet, briskly to furl the sail and stow it then. Each in place, they poised the smooth oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. No long task for a burning heat came down. From Helios, Lord of High Noon, going forward, I carried a wax along the line and laid it thick on their oars. They tied me up, then plumbed amidships back to the mast, last, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to rowing. Soon, as we came smartly, within hailing distance, the two Serenies, noting out fast, sh our fast ship of their point, made ready, and they sang, This way, O turn your bow, a key is glory, as all the world allows, more and be merry. Sweet couple there, as we sing, no lonely seafarer holds, Clear of entering our green mirror, pleased by each purling note, like honey twining from her throat in my throat, who lies a pining. Sea robbers here take joy, voyaging onward as from our song of Troy, graybeard and rower boy, goeth more learned, all feats on that great field for the long wayfare. Dark days the bright ga gods willed, wound you boy. Or there, Argos old soldiery on Troy, each teeming, charmed out of time we see no life on earth can be, hid from our dreaming. The lovely voices in Arger, appealing over the water, made me crave to listen, and I tried to say, untie me, to the crew, jerking my boat brows, but they bent steadily to the, steady to the oars. Then Paramedes got to his feet, he and Eurylochos, and Pass more line about to hold me still, so all rode on until the serenities dropped under the sea rim, and the singing dwindled away. My faithful company rested on their oars now, now peeling off the wax I had laid thick on their 
ears, then set me free, but scarcely had that island faded in blue air, then I saw smoke and white water with sounds of waves and tumult. A sound the men heard, and it terrified them. Oars flew from their hands. The blades were knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way, with no oar blades to drive her through the water. While well, I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing over them, every oarsman saying gently, Friends! Have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome is it now than when the cl the Kyclops penned us in his cave. What power he had! Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? By hook, now I say by hook or crook, this peril too shall be something that we remember. Heads up, lads. We must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands and lay back. Harden your benches. Hit these breaking seas. Zeus helped us pull away before we found her. You at the tiller listen and take in all that I say. The rudders are your duty. Keep her out of the combers and the smoke. Steer for that headland. Watch the drift. Or we fetch up in the smother and you drown us. That was all and it brought them round in action. But as I sent them on towards Skyla, I told them nothing as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their own... Their oars again in panic to roll for cover under the decking. Kirky's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied my on my cuirass and took up two heavy spears that made my way along to the foredeck. Thinking to see her first from there, the monster of the grey rock harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside, Veiled and loud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. And all this time, in travail, sobbing, gaining up on, gaining on the current, we rowed into the strait. Skylar to port and on our starboard beam, Caribidus, dire, gorge of the salt sea tide. By heaven, when she vomited all the sea, was like a cauldron, seething over intense fire when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. The shot spoon soared to the landslide heights and fell like rain. But when she swallowed the sea water down, we saw the funnel of the maelstrom. I heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark s sand raged on the bottom far below. My men all blanched against the gloom. Our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. Then Skylar made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. We got the ways to go. I happened to glance at aft at ship and oarsmen, and caught sight of their arms and legs dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and the bait far out, will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling from the, through the air. So these were borne aloft in spasms toward the cliff. cliff. She ate them as they shrieked there in her den. In the dire grapple reaching still for me, and deathly pity ran me through. At that sight, far the worst I ever suffered, questing the passes of the strange sea, we rode on. The rocks were now behind Caribidus, too, and Skyla dropped astern. Then we were coasting the noble island of the god, where grazed those cattle with wide brows and bounteous flocks of Helios, lord of noon, who rides high heaven. From the black ship far still at sea, I heard the lowing of the cattle winding home, and she bleeding her too in my heart. The words of blind Teresis of Thebes and Kirkes of Ahia both forbade me the island of the world's delight, the sun, so I spoke on a gloom to my companion, shipmates grieving and weary though you are. Listen, I had forewarning from Teresis and Kirky too, both told me I must shun this island of the sun. The world's delight nothing but fatal trouble shall we find here. Pull away then and put the land astern. They stra that strained them to the breaking point, and cursing Eurylochos cried out in bitterness, Are you flesh and blood, Odysseus, to endure more than a man can? Do you ever tire? God, look at you. Iron is what you are made of. Here we all are, half dead with weariness. Falling asleep over the oars, and you say no landing, no firm island earth where we could make a quiet supper. No, pull out the sea, you say, with night upon us, just as before. 
but wandering now in lost sudden storms can rise at night and swamp ships without a trace. Where is your shelter? If some stiff gale blows up from some south or west, the winds that break up shipping every time, when seamen flout the Lord God's will, I say do as the hour demands and go ashore before black night comes down. We'll make our supper alongside and at dawn put out to sea. Now when the rest said I to this, I saw the power of destiny devising ill sharply, I answered without hesitation. You're a Lockos. They are with you to a man. I am alone out match. Let this whole company swear me a great oath. Any herd of cattle or flock of sheep here found shall go unharmed. No one shall slaughter out of wantonness. Ram or heifer, all shall be content with what the goddess Kirkies put aboard. They fell at once to swearing as they ordered, and when this round of oaths had ceased, we found a half-moon bay to beach and bore the ship in the fresh spring nearby, all hands ashore. Went about skillfully, getting up a meal. Then, after thirst and hunger, those besiegers were turned away. They mourned for their companions, plucked from the ship by Skyla, and devoured. <coughs> then sleep came soft upon them as they mourned. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven and clouds driven by through shrouded land and sea in a night of storm. So just as dawn with fingertips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto out of sea a sea cave, where nymphs had chairs of rock and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, Old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's holds. Food and drink, the cattle here are not for our provision. Oh, we pay dearly for it. Fierce the god is who cherishes <coughs> these heifers and these sheep. Helios, and no man avoids his eye. To this my fighters nodded. Yes, but now we had a month of onshore short gales, blowing day in, day out, south winds, or south by east. As long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up, to ease their craving, they would soon touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, hunger drove them to scour the wild shore with angling hooks, bush fishers, and sea fowl. Whenever... Whatever fell into their hands in lean days wore their bellies thin. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympus, all the gods, but they for in. They, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now on the shore, your locos made his insidious plea. plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us, mortal wretches. But famine is the most pitiful, the worst in the end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home, the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes... We all build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. But if he flares up over his heifer's loss, wishing our ships destroyed and the gods make cause with him, then I say, better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste your skin and bones on a lonely island. Thus the Eurolocos and they muttered I, trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now they, that day, tranquil cattle with broad the broad, broad brows were gazing near, and soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak. Having no barley, met, barley meal to strew the victims, prefer, performed the prayers and ritual, knifed the kind of laid each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings of strips of meat were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first. And when the bones were burnt and tripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. Just then my slumber left me in a rush. My eyes opened, and I went down the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of a, of a black hull and savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me. Grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, O Father Zeus, and gods in bliss forever. You made me sleep away this day of mischief, O cruel drowsing in the evil hour. 
Here they sat in the great work they contrived. Lampicia in her long gown, meanwhile, had borne swift word to the overlord of noon. They have killed your kind, and the lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the immortals. O Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus' men so overwhelm, so overweening. Now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning, when I climbed the star of, sky of stars, and eventually when I bore westward from heaven, restitution of or penalty they shall pay and pay in full, or I shall go, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus, who drives the storm cloud, made reply, Peace, Helios, shine on among the gods. Shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white-hot bolt and make splinters of their ships in the wine-dark wine sea. Calypso later told me of this exchange as she declared that Hermes had told her. Well, when I reached the sea cave in the ship, I faced each man and had it out, but where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear. Cow hides began to crawl, and beef both raw and roasted. Load like kind upon the spits. Now six full days my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef. They had marked for slaughter from Helios's herd, and, the Ze and Zeus, the son of Kronos, added one fine morning. All the gales had ceased blown out, and with an offshore breeze, we launched again. Here comes Lil, stepping the mast and sail to, mass, to make for the open sea. Astern of us, the island coastline faded and no land showed anywhere, but only sea in heaven when Zeus, Cronian, piled a thunderhead above the ship. While gloom spread on the ocean, we held our course but briefly, and the squall struck whining from the west with gale force breaking, both four stays in the mast came toppling aft along the ship's strength, so the running rigging showered into the bilge on the dark excuse me, on the after deck. The mast had hit the steersman a slant blow, bashing the skull in, knocking him overside as a brave soul fell, led the body like a diver with crack on crack of thunder. Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she buckled in. She bucked in, reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. No more seafaring, homeward for these. No sweet days of return. The god had turned his face from them. I clambered for and aft my hulk under a com comber. Split her keel from ribs, and the big timber floated from the mast too. Broke away a back stray floated bangling from it. Stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together than I straddled right in the frightful storm, nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the west wind dropped, and a southeast gale came on, one more, twist of the knife taking me north again, straight for Carabidus. <laughs> All the night I drifted in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Skyla Mountain and Carabidus deep. There as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great big tree, catching on like a bat under a bough. No way had I understand, no way of climbing the root, and bull being far away, being far below, and far above my head, the branches and their leaves massed overshadowing Caravitus pool, but I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted, and ah, how long with what desire I waited till at the twilight hour, when one would be who hears and judges please in the marketplace all day, being contentious men. Goes home to supper, the long poles at last reared from the sea. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride, and rode hard with my hands to pass by Skyla. Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men this time kept me from her eyes. Once through the straight nine days, I drifted in the open sea before I made ashore, made sure, buoyed up by the gods, Upon Augea Island, the dangerous nymph Calypso live, lives and sings there. In her beauty, and she received me, loved me. At the same time, by why, by, 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 but why tell the same tale that I told last night in Hall to you and your lady? Those advertisers made a long evening. I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. 
It's the end of book 12. In the next video, we will get into book 13. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell, please. And also, when we are finished Homer, after the new year sometime, we are going to be reading straight through. I'm going to get all the books of uh, Alice in Wonderland, and that's going to be the, the entire project, a fun project that I've been wanting to do, read Alice in Wonderland. Also, I'm going to be some streaming videos of some Christmas, uh, streaming Christmas story videos, because this is the month of December, and I... I always make, I don't usually stream them, but I'm going to stream them this year. But you stay safe and healthy, and you have a great night and until the next video. And I promise I will start making more videos. And thank you and good night.